This is Holy Trinity Sunday, and it's also the start of our series, a four-part series on what is called the Decalogue. I got one person that looked at me like they knew what that meant. Does anybody in here know what the Decalogue is? Raise your hand. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> Anyone who's in here, who's been here, when, since I've been here that's been confirmed in that amount of time, you're no longer confirmed. <laughs> the Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. Martin Luther said that if a man knows the Ten Commandments, the man knows all of Scripture. So why is it important for us to know the Ten Commandments? And why is it appropriate that we start a lesson series on the Ten Commandments on Holy Trinity Sunday? We'll get to all of those in just a second. But first, I want to show you my, uh, my, my picture. Okay. This, this picture is a little bit clearer than, than my icon, which I will set up here. So you can see it when you come for communion. This icon was done by Rublev, a Russian artist, who um, designed the, the Trinity. And here you have, right, you have over here the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you see behind God is the mountain because they got the what from God on the mountain? The law from God on the mountain. Behind Jesus is a tree. Why tree? Because the cross was made out of a tree. Right? Deuteronomy actually said, Cursed is the man who's hung on the tree, which refers to the cross. And behind the Holy Spirit is the temple. If you'll notice, you can't really see it very well because it's kind of washed out, but they all look basically the same. They all have wings. They all have all this stuff. But there's one really cool thing about this image, and this is why I love it. I told the, the kids up here that God was created to be in relationship, and God is never alone because God is always God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're always together as one. We recognize Him as three different people, but we don't. that's not the way that it works. God is always together as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit every time. He's always in relationship. And the beautiful thing about this picture is this little spot right here. Can you know, am I standing in the way over here? Some of you probably can't see that. Right? This little spot right here. This little opening. To me, this says that this trinity or this three-piece thing is not complete. There's an opening. Right? A triangle is shut on all three sides. You have three points. This doesn't have... It's not complete. What needs to fill in that space? God is open to being in a relationship with you. And that is why we have the Ten Commandments. See, we think, as Christians, we think that God came to a... Christ came, not God. Christ came. And when Christ came and died on the tree, what did He do to the law? What do we think as Christians Christ did to the law? As Christians, do we have to follow the law? This, this means yes, this means no. It's going to be a long morning if you're not participating. You say yes. We still have to follow the law. Well, then you're not like most Christians then. I say yes, we will try. Because, because most Christians would say when Christ came and died on the cross that he abolished the law. Right? He got rid of the law. So we no longer have to follow the law. The law is not something that, is something that we have to do. Because the other, the other way that people think about the law is the law is the way that we get to go to heaven. Right? The law is that which provides us with an, an, with an inlet to, to do ourselves enough good works that we can earn our salvation and make our way to heaven. Is that what happens? No, it's not possible to do that. You see, the death law was given to the people so that they could understand the promises that God was making to them. Do you realize that the word in Hebrew for commandment is also the same word as promise? So maybe they're not things that we have to do, but they're promises that we get to fulfill. Because one person could hear something that is a, that is a, a rule that they have to follow, and another person can hear that same thing and hear it as a promise that they get to do. Right? Some of us have to come to worship, 
Some of us get, that was a short, that was, a, some of us have to come to worship, right? And some of us get to come to worship. Actually, all of us get to come to worship. You see, God gave the commandment so that people could understand how it was that God wanted them to live. Because here's the thing that we always miss, or we seem to miss, right? If you look at the front cover of your bulletin, it says that the, the, the theme for today, it was supposed to be who's in charge, but I changed it last minute to be 19 comes before 20, which is a, yeah, duh, right? But what does that mean? And actually, as, as Val was reading today, I wanted to say, and I think it's four comes before five. Before we get to that, I have one other thing for us to look at with the Ten Commandments. How many versions of the Ten Commandments are there? I heard two. Two. And then, and then but the, 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 the real question, I heard three. The real question would be is, what do you mean, Pastor? Do you mean in the Bible, or do you mean in order that different denominations follow? Because in the Bible, the Ten Commandments is found how many times? Twice. Where? Exodus, because we're just starting to read it out of Exodus, so that's a good one right there off the top of your head. And the other one is Deuteronomy. But how many different actual versions of the Ten Commandments are there? Because when I arrived here, we actually had the Ten Commandments hanging up in the education hallway. And now every one of those posters is in my office. Why? Because it's the wrong ordering. There are actually three different versions of the Ten Commandments that are used by different denominations out there on, on, on ordering of what is going on and how they are to be interpreted. Ours is the middle one here, right? Where we do this weird thing at the bottom where we separate out not coveting your neighbor's, your neighbor's spouse and then not coveting any of the other stuff your neighbor has. We don't want to... For some reason, we, we, we really want to talk a lot about this coveting thing um, where the other ones just sum it up in one... The most interesting part here is that the Jewish understanding is that the one that we have today is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and freed you from the house of slavery. And, and the Jews don't see that as a commandment, but they see that as a word. They actually say these are the ten words that God gives us by which to live. You see, because that little part there earlier, 19 comes before 20. If you look back at the reading, in chapter 19, what did God do? God said, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God brought the people out of Egypt. He created the relationship with his people and brought them out of the house of slavery. He brought them to himself. And then in chapter 20, he says, these are the things that you need. This is how you should live. See, these commandments are not about us following a set of rules so that we can earn our way into heaven. These guidelines are a way that God tells us, now that you are my people, now that I have saved you, now that I have brought you out of the land of slavery and I have freed you from where you have been, now these are the things that you should do and how you should live. Right? 19 comes before 20. We don't get the laws or the guidelines for living until we are already made God's people. Well, you can take that back and go, well, back in chapter 19, he said, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. But still, that's 5 and 6 after verse 4, where he said, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. If you keep these commandments, if you keep these words, then you're going to be my most treasured possession. But if you don't, you're still mine. Right? Nowhere does God ever say that if you don't follow the Ten Commandments, I'm no longer going to love you. Because is it possible for us to keep the Ten Commandments? Actually, the way that they're written, yes. It probably is. Don't, don't steal. Don't kill. Don't lie. Really? 
there's, there's at least three of you in here that should say that that's not a commandment. Don't bear false witness. Don't steal, don't kill, don't bear false witness. Don't look upon what someone else has and want it. Love God, honor your, your mother and father. On the, on the way that they're written, it should be pretty easy for us not to do that. It's when Jesus comes in and then kind of expands on it that it gets a little bit harder and, and completely impossible. But the point of the commandments is not that we follow this set of rules so that we can earn our way into a relationship with God. God already created that in the Trinity. God already created that when he pulled us out of Egypt. God already created that when he sent his son to die for every last one of us. That relationship is set. Now these guidelines are put into place so that we can understand how we should act towards not him, but each other. You see, it's all about that relationship. And actually, we'll look next week at the three that go this way. And then the next week, we'll look at six that go this way. And the last week, you'll look at the last one that goes this way. But it's not about us making our way to God. It's about God already claiming us and helping us to understand how we are to live with each other and to love each other. <laughs> and to help His love be made known to the world. So don't look at the Ten Commandments as rules that you have to follow. But look at the Ten Commandments as guidelines that you get to use in order to share God's love better with the world. And that will make all the difference in our understanding of who we are in Christ. So know that your relationship is already set and that God is merely giving us guidelines on how to live with each other here so that once we get to that final banquet, his love will truly be made known through everyone.